Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of IHR TV. Today, I'm interviewing Ray Zong, Program Associate at the Wilson Center in Washington. Ray Zong, thank you for being with us today. Sure. Reporters Without Borders said recently that the global pandemic could have been averted or lessened if journalists had more freedom in China. Do you agree? Despite a lot of barriers, it's actually quite remarkable seeing some of the domestic reporting work that's been done in China. Obviously, there are the issues of, you know, censorship and takedowns, but domestic outlets, including um, ones that are somewhat party adjacent, like the paper, they've been actually doing a lot of legwork on examining hospital conditions and the coronavirus response. Having said that, the issue of journalist expulsions from American outlets, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, have been really concerning But those, I think, are tied to longer term and deeper running tensions between China and the United States and less specific to the coronavirus crisis. So do you think that there has been an improvement so far? Well, this is this is a very good question, because China's always had reporters that have been willing and qualified to do reporting work on natural disasters pandemic outbreaks, and other types of issues. The problem is whether or not they have enough institutional support and enough wiggle room to have their reporting be published and stay published, which is always the sort of issue. Um, In the case of COVID-19, a lot of work ran into the issue of well, this might be a rumor or this isn't a sort of politically palatable issue, so it's branded as a rumor. And so that really hindered the speed with which reporters could get information out to the public and the ability of the public to really digest and act uh, in accordance with the news they were able to consume. Chinese doctor Li Wenliang tried to warn his colleagues and people about the danger of this virus, but he was told by the police to stop making false comments and was even investigated for spreading rumors. How did Chinese media report on this story? The item that set off a lot of people was the signed confession that he had to sign off on as a part of his disciplinary committee investigation. In the aftermath of his death, a lot of people on social media would repeat like this series of phrases where he had to check off saying like, do you understand? Can you do this? Meaning, can you stop spreading rumors? The Chinese government is, if not anything else, really, really prepared to manicure, to sculpt, and to ensure that its official narrative is the narrative. So right now they have an official timeline for China's COVID-19 response that's been released. It's obviously the authorized and what they designate as the authoritative narrative. And uh, Li Wenliang is a person who I don't think they can really afford to denigrate forever. So they've actually sort of designated him as a martyr, incorporated him into uh, the narrative. And um, essentially, the move means to sort of close the books on people looking more critically into the conditions that Li Wenliang worked under, and the reasons uh, why he faced the difficulties that he did. From accusing its doctors of spreading rumors, how did the Chinese government end up depicting China as a global leader in the fight against COVID-19? This is, uh, I think, something of a challenge that the Chinese government has run into as time has passed. People um, now know about this doctor who was very very nondescript before this. He was just a rank and file eye doctor. In its global response, the cover-up, which is mostly domestic, is something that I think 
a lot of governments, including the U.S., this is something that they've been confronting China about. And this is something that I think China has pivoted away from because it does not think that this is something that foreign countries should dictate to China. And it's been sort of shrugging off those types of criticisms. But because of the domestic scale of the cover-up, they did have to discipline somebody, and that somebody was the Wuhan um, mayor who was replaced. What about the media? How did Chinese media report on the coronavirus outbreak and on Li Wenliang? Well, first of all, it has to. It, there's a political motive to preserve the political security of the Chinese Communist Party, which means preserving the political security of Xi Jinping. Um, and so, Xi Jinping's um, actions obviously got like a little coat of gloss. He has to be depicted as the person calling the shots in uh, what China's done successfully. So infrastructure testing, hospital logistics uh, coordination, comparing China's sort of case drop with, you know, how the U.S. is managing its uh, COVID-19 crisis is also one tactic that's used. China uh, is also engaging in mass diplomacy overseas and really incorporating that into the narrative. I would say that one term that really, really sticks out in China's propaganda campaign and narrative formation is the word uh, positive energy, positive sounding stories, heroic nurses, you know, the two temporary hospitals that were set up in Wuhan in days. Um, They use those positive stories to really uh, take up a lot of space and take up people's attention so that less uh, thought is given to, well, what caused this problem in the first place? Are there any systemic issues that we need to be paying attention to behind this? What are some popular conspiracy theories circulating in China regarding the virus? I know that state-controlled social media accounts are spreading theories to create confusion about the origin of COVID-19, according to some recent reports. The U.S.-China relationship has, at the forefront, had diplomats sniping at each other using conspiracy theories. Um, So on Chinese uh, diplomats and foreign ministry spokespeople have been um, circulating this unfounded theory that U.S. military games held in China in 2019 was the origin of the virus. There's no evidence for this. At the moment, there is also not really any evidence that the COVID-19 virus originated in a virology lab in Wuhan. Um, There is a possibility that it did But right now, there's no way to know for sure. And so this has been the forefront of communications between China and the U.S. What needs to be done to halt the spread of fake news related to Chinese identity, culture and habits? People that, you know, have been saying, oh, you know, Chinese people eat bats, Chinese people are unclean. I'm not going to get into those because those don't actually deserve an answer. What I actually want to talk about is uh, a more sort of sophisticated way of, you know, spreading rumors about Chinese people. I saw that there were claims that, you know, Wuhan effectively just let a bunch of Chinese people travel. And that's how the virus spread. Most Chinese travelers by the end of January and into February were already starting to be wary of the coronavirus and self-isolating. This is in contrast to European travelers and American travelers who may or may not have been aware or may or may not have been observing quarantine. And uh, the the New York Times actually debunked uh, this by uh, finding out that European travelers actually caused um, more uh, issues in New York's outbreak than Asian travelers. And I think in terms of, you know, only Chinese travelers are a vector for the virus is a pretty uh, sort of subtle but also harmful stereotype that uh, really needs to be addressed.
The pandemic has taken a huge toll on China's economy and most of their production has significantly slowed. But what has been the impact on small businesses and the communities which are hit hardest by the virus? A lot of China's informal economy was really, really, really hurt badly. Um, And this actually is something you can see in the response to COVID-19. A lot of uh, workers who were building um, the temporary hospitals had trouble finding, you know, housing after they had finished constructing the hospitals because of fears of contagion. Um, you had, you know, hospitality and food service workers in China, most of which are rural um, Chinese who traveled to cities to find more stable jobs were um out of work and since they were usually paid on uh, temporary contracts or by task, uh, they were unable to um, earn any wages during um, the period where Wuhan was under lockdown. Uh, Factory workers um, generally will, like if there are lower production uh, outputs, which there are, they are liable to have their wages garnished or withheld. And as China's economy slowly sort of ramps up, um, both formally employed workers in its manufacturing sector and the informal economy of China's migrant workers, they're very, very vulnerable um, and are likely to be hit much harder than China's white collar workers who are, you know, teleworking at home. Now, let's talk about disinformation because you have said many times that China is a producer of disinformation, but also a target. Can you explain more about this? I think that um, when, when China is a producer of misinformation, it starts at home because China's goal is first and foremost to Um, maintain political stability and political security for the CCP at home. As the problem of the virus, you know, can be traced back to China, this is uh, something that I think a lot of politicians have seized on as an opportunity to try to find, like, one single uh, source of the problem. When COVID-19 is complex, it's comprehensive, it hits economies, it hits, um, you know, a lot of different segments of different populations, and certainly in the United States, very hard. I think it, it's not something that can solely be solved by taking uh, a one type of hawkish policy on China. It's also something that you need to devise a domestic response to, and there are no shortcuts getting around that. Do you think that anything positive could come out of this crisis in terms of censorship and disinformation, both in China and globally? In terms of cooperation, I've been really heartened by some of the technical cooperation I've seen between, um, you know, Chinese hospitals and Chinese scientific institutions um, and their international counterparts. But, you know, as I mentioned previously, The more politically sensitive the information is, the less China is necessarily willing to cooperate or share the information openly. So there are obviously limits to this. You have recently worked on the Columbia University Journalism Review. Tell me more about it. So um, I was talking to a journalist named De Yi Yang, who is also, like myself, um, from Wuhan. Um, And our conversation basically... Uh, encompassed, you know, the question of how did the U.S. media respond to, you know, the news of COVID-19 spreading within China in January. And obviously, you know, many of the excellent China correspondents saw the gravity of the problem. Some, uh, many of them were based in Wuhan and doing on the ground reporting. If you, if you think back to what the U.S. media was really, really focused on in January, it was the 2020 election, pretty much around the clock. The COVID-19 pandemic, well, we didn't know it was a pandemic at the time, but um, 
that was something that really, really struggled to break through um, to the top of the news cycle, uh, unfortunately. Ray Zong, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for talking to me. And thank you for being with us for another episode of iChart TV. From myself, Margarita Kerkasaki, until next time, goodbye.